the previous class what did we study we have studied what a problem on one dimensional uh, um, simplex element or a 1d bar element uh, to determine the shape functions and we derived the shape functions for 2d simplex element or we can also call it as 2d triangular element or triangular element in the exam if they ask you to find out the shape functions for uh, triangular element in terms of global coordinates you have to solve the you have to solve the same derivation in the exam okay so today what we'll do is we'll solve a problem on that okay so the in the fashion uh, how we uh, derived it in the same fashion we'll solve the problem you can take down the question so the temperatures wait a second you can take down the question you can take down the question the temperatures at the nodes of a triangle element are given by t of i t of j t of i equal to 2 210 degree fahrenheit t of j equal to 270 degree fahrenheit and t of k equal to 250 degree fahrenheit if the nodal coordinates are x of i and y of i so while deriving we used x1 y1 so in the problem it is directly being given in terms of general form okay that is x i y i equal to 50 and 30 unit is inches and x j y j 70 and 50 x k y k 50 and 60 determine the shape functions of the element uh, element and uh, temperature at the point x comma y equal to 60 comma 40 inside the element so in the previous problem for 1d what we determined we determined the shape function okay n1 n2 and we wrote the interpolation functions once we uh, got the shape functions r1 into we substituted those uh, in the general equation and we got the interpolation function in terms of shape functions then they were uh, they asked us to find out what is the temperature at x equal to 45 centimeter same way here first we have to find out what was shape function n1 n2 and n3 that is ni nj and nk then get the interpolation functions then substitute x and y as 60 and 40 and find out what is the temp what is the temperature at this point okay so this is your triangle element this is your triangle element or 2d simplex element also node 1 node 2 and node 3 and these are the coordinates okay this is your first coordinate 50 40 okay then second coordinate 70 70 50 and uh, third coordinate it is 55 60 and these are the temperatures at those nodes uh, one, uh, 1, 2 and 3 so this is i, j and k okay now you have to find out what is ni, n of j, n of k and t of x comma y at 60 and 40 so you can take down the question we will proceed with the solution Put a message in the chat box once you take down the question. done 
put a message in the chat box okay put a message in the chat box okay yes or no Done? I'll just wait for another 30 uh, few seconds and then I'll move to the next slide. The way in which we have uh, done the derivation in the same fashion will be uh, solving the problem. So no need to remember the equations for n1, n2, and n3. Okay, without remembering that, we can easily solve this. The way we have done your derivation, right? In the same fashion, we can solve this as well. So let me move to the next slide. So as we assume the polynomial function for the uh, displacement variable that is u equal to a0 plus a1x plus a2y. Here the field variable is temperature. So we will assume t of x comma y equal to a0 plus a1x plus a2y. We will take any one. We will not take both x and y. Okay. We will not take the field uh, polynomial function for uh, displacement in x direction and displacement in y direction. We will only consider only with respect to one direction, temperature in one direction. Okay. So this is the expression. So t of x comma y equal to a0 plus a1x plus a2y. Okay. So when you write this equation in matrix form, this is how you will get. So the coefficients of a0, a1 and a2 are these. So when you and these are your generalized coordinates a0, a1 and a2. Okay. So when you apply the boundary conditions, can you tell me what are the boundary conditions? These are written once you apply the boundary conditions. After applying boundary conditions at all three nodes, as I've told you, right, at x equal to xi and y equal to yi. What is your temperature T? T will be equal to T of i. Same when it is x equal to xj, y equal to yj, so t equal to t of j. Okay, then same when x equal to xk, y equal to yk, t equal to t of k. Okay, equal to t of k. When you substitute these boundary conditions in this equation, you will get three equations, three system of equations. When you write that in matrix form, this is how we will how we'll write. So one xi yi one xj yj 1 xk yk so when you multiply this with this you will get three equations three system of equations now you know what is the value of x of i x of y of i x of j and y of j x of k and y of k and even you know what are the values of t of i t of j and t of k now what you are supposed to find out what we did in the derivations once we have written this we took this on the other side right and it will become inverse of the matrix. Same way here, we'll took this. We'll take this once we substitute the values of x of i till y of k. We'll take this on the other side, inverse of the matrix. Then we'll find out what are the generalized coordinates e naught, a one, and a two. Okay. Same way, uh, the way we did uh, the derivation. Okay. So I'll tell you how to directly calculate uh, the inverse of a matrix using your calculator while doing the derivation. Wait a second. Yeah. While doing the derivation, 
you found out at the adjoint of a matrix divided by determinant of the matrix okay if the values are given to you if it is a 3 cross 3 matrix so you can directly use your calculator and find out what is the inverse of the matrix okay what is the inverse of the matrix second down put a message in the chat box yeah okay so let me move on to the next slide so here first i have written it inverse i have taken this this matrix on the other side if you take it on the other side it will be one upon this matrix if i take it up it will be inverse so that is what is written here okay inverse after that i have substituted the values of x of i y of i x of j y of j x of k and y of k so substitute here I'll tell you how to find out the inverse of the matrix and you'll get this as the answer. This is your inverse of matrix, including your determinant of matrix. It is complete. This term is adjoint of a mat this matrix is adjoint of a matrix divided by de determinant of the matrix. Okay. Adjoint of a matrix divided by determinant of the matrix. Now this is what you get. I'll tell you how to find out. Anyone knows how to find out inverse of matrix directly using a calculator? Say yes or no in the chat box. I'll help you out. Okay. You can take your calculator in your hand, everyone. Uh, put a message in the chat box whether you know how to calculate uh, the inverse of a matrix directly from the calculator. Anyone knows it? Sir, if you don't mind, can you show the previous slide? Okay, okay, no problem. Okay. Now, every anyone, can you calculate this? And you have to get this as the answer. So this is the inverse of this matrix. Okay. So everyone, uh, everyone is having the calculator f x nine nine one e s. Is it right? E s plus. Okay. F x nine nine one e s plus. You have to go to mode. Okay, you have to go to mode and press 6. So, matrix, you have to select matrix. Okay, then it will ask you, are you doing it along with me? Say yes or no. Say yes or no. Okay, so it is asking you what? Matrix A, matrix B, and matrix C. Is it right? So, press 1. Now, it will ask you what is the size of the matrix m cross n whether it is 3 cross 3 3 cross 2 3 cross 1 so on so it is what 3 cross 3 matrix so press 1 it will ask you to enter the values of the matrix so go on entering the values 1 50 then 30 1 70 50 1 55 and 60 done so once you enter, then press AC. Okay, it will be stored. That matrix, what you have done, is stored in matrix A now. Okay, matrix A now. Now press Shift four. Press Shift four. Press Shift four. Now select three matrix A. So matrix A will be written there. Where you type your numbers right to calculate then matrix a will be written now after this just uh, below the on the x raised to minus one is there okay uh, which one uh, now you have stored the matrix you have stored the matrix in the uh, matrix a okay first you go to uh, mode you have to select six okay matrix then it will ask you which matrix to uh, enter. Okay. Press 1. Okay. Then it will ask you what is the size of the matrix. Okay. It is 3 cross 3. We have 3 cross 3 matrix. Then press 1. Enter the values. 150, all the values you enter. Okay. Okay. All the values you enter. Let me do it once again. Okay. 60. Now you press Shift 4. 
Number four, shift four matrix is written. Okay. Okay. What did what did you get? Okay. Now press AC. Press AC. Okay. Press AC. You should get zero there. Okay. You should get zero there. Just zero. Okay. On the screen. Now press shift four. Now you have entered matrix A, right? So press three. Are you getting six, eight, uh, eight options there? Dimension, matrix A, B, C, determinant, data. Are you getting it? Uh, just make sure you press AC. Press AC. Shift then four. Shift uh, shift four. Uh, yeah, yeah. Then you press three. It will write the matrix A. Now x raised to minus 1 is there on your, uh, on your calculator. Just press that. Then you press equals. Then you press equals. Are you getting the same uh, matrix? 2.9, minus 2.7, 0 0.8, minus 0 0.02, 0 0.06, 0 minus 0.04. Minus 0 0.03, minus 0 0.01, and 0 0.04. Are you getting it? Directly you will get. Yeah, directly, right? This this matrix you are getting directly, right? You have to get this matrix. But you make sure you have entered this matrix correctly in matrix A. Okay. Others, others, are you getting it? Okay, okay. So this is how you have to find out uh, inverse of a matrix directly using your calculator. Okay, whether it is one cross or whether it is two cross two matrix or three cross three, not more than that. Okay, not more than that. Okay. Now, so once you got this, so this is your generalized coordinates a naught, a one, and a two. Now what you are supposed to do this after this. What you did once you find out the generalized coordinates e0, e1 and e2, you substitute that back in this e expression, this expression. You have to substitute that here. You have to substitute that over here. So that is what is done here. Okay. Substitute this over here. Now what? You have to multiply. Uh, yeah. You have to multiply this with this you will get this term. Again, this with this. You have to multiply it. You will get this. This with this. You will get this. So, these are your shape functions n1, n2 and n3. That is ni, nj and nk. So, 1 into 2.9. So, plus. So, it is minus here. So, minus 0 0.02x minus 0 0.03y. So, this term. Same again. This multiplied by this. Okay. So, 1 so minus 2.7 so plus 0.06x okay this multiplied by this and this multiplied by this so minus 0 0.01 into y similarly the last one so 1 into 0 0.8 so 0 0.8 into sorry x into minus 0 0.04 and plus 0 0.04 y these are your three equations these are your shape functions n of i n of j and this is your n of Okay. So without remembering all that general expressions of n1, n2, and n3, you have solved what are the shape functions for the given triangle element given the coordinates. Got it? So this is written in general here. So where ni, ni is this, nj is this, and nk is this. Got it? Put a message in the chat box. Got it everyone? Got it? Take down and we'll uh, proceed. So first part is done.
So finding the shape functions n i, n of j and n of k. Now you have to substitute this n of i, n of j and write it like this separately, okay, all together. So multiply this and this and write it, okay. So that is your polynomial interpolation model, okay, that is your interpolation model in terms of shape functions n i, n of j and n of k. Got it everyone? Should I proceed to the next slide? Finding the what is the temperature at t of x comma y 60 and 40. Okay. Now All the shape functions are written separately here. This is n of i, n of j, and n of k. Now you have to find out what is t of x comma y at 60 comma 40. Okay. So in general, the same expression which you have here, this has been multiplied and written like this. And you substitute the values of n of i, n of j, n of k in this expression, and then substitute x equal to 60 and uh, y equal to 40. You will get at this point your temperature is 240 degree Fahrenheit. So this is how we have to solve problems on 2D triangle element or 2D simplex element. Okay, 2D triangle element or 2D simplex element. Just verify the answer whether it is 240 or not. So if in the question, this in this question, they have not asked you to write out what is the interpolation function. So when they ask you to write out what is the interpolation function in terms of shape function, right? After this, you have substituted. Before you substitute the value of x and y here. You have to simplify this and write the equation, okay? Like this, as you have, as you have only n one is written, right? In the same fashion, you have to simplify this whole 2.9 minus 2.7 plus 0.8. Then this, this, and this. Okay, like this, you have to simplify and then write the equation. So this completes your uh, derivation on uh, 1D simplex and 2D simplex and one problem on each topic, okay, each. Then one more topic is there on 3D simplex element or tetrahedral element. Now what we'll do is we'll uh, go through the properties of shape functions. I have told you the properties, but we will go through them once again. Okay. Should I go to the next slide? 
Are you getting the answer to 40 degree Fahrenheit? Okay, now we'll go through the properties of shape functions. Okay, shape function corresponding to any specific node, okay, any specific node such as node i varies linearly from a value of 1 at that node i, okay, at this node i to a value of 0. It varies from 1 to 0, okay, linearly from you might have seen, right, you have drawn. The shape function for shape and variation of shape function. So this is the shape function variation for 1D element n1. Okay. This, this is your node 1 or node i, node j or node 2. n1 will be equal to 1. Okay. And it will vary linearly to value of 0 at each of the remaining nodes. You can see here. If there are multiple nodes here. 2, 3, 4, so on. N1 will be 1 at its own node and it will vary linearly along the element and will be 0 at other nodes. Okay, will be 0 at other node. Thus, the shape function n of i will have a value of 1 at node i. Okay, that is your node i. Okay, and a value of 0 and a value of 0 at each of the remaining nodes of the element. Okay, each of the remaining nodes of the element. So, this is your first property of shape function and what is the second property of shape function the sum of all shape functions at any point within the element now if i take the shape function n2 also both if i take this point this where this plus this it is sum is always one if, the, if i take this point and this point sum is always one if i take this point here n1 will be 0.5 n2 will be 0.5 sum is always one okay and n1 will be so shape functions will be one at its own node okay and zero at all other nodes okay and sum of all shape functions at any point if you take any point this point this point this point this point this point anywhere the sum will be always equal to one okay including its boundaries will be equal to one that is shape function n1 plus n2 plus n uh, sorry n2 plus n3 plus so on okay it is, will be always equal to 1 it will be always equal to 1 if these two properties are satisfied okay if these two properties are satisfied such type of elements are called as c not continuity elements c not continuity elements c not Continuity elements. C not continuity elements. So these are the properties of shape functions. So it can be asked, define what is shape function and what are the properties of shape function for two marks, two to three marks. It can be asked. So this is about properties of shape function. After this, we'll move on to convergence uh, requirements. Okay, convergence requirements. Done. Checking. Yes.
Should we go to the next slide? Yes, sir. Okay. Now we'll move on to convergence requirements. Uh, so there are three convergence requirements. You should know what is the convergence criteria first. What is the convergence criteria? FIFM provides a numerical solution to a complex problem as you know. As the mesh is made finer, the solution converges to the exact solution. What does this sentence mean? As the mesh that is discretization when you divide a body into smaller number of subdivisions. Okay, you are meshing your body, right? Meshing your continuum. As you do on uh, reducing the size of the elements smaller and smaller, that is finer and finer, solution will converge to your exact solution. Okay, the graphs were drawn, right? If this is your uh, exact solution for constant term, your solution will be approximate solution like this. If you go on increasing the order of the polynomial, same way if you go on increasing the uh, number of elements. Okay, it means you are increasing the order of the polynomial as well. Okay, your solution will be closer to your exact solution. Okay, solution will be closer to your exact solution. Okay, this is achieved by the following conditions. Okay, your first convergence requirement: the displacement models must be continuous within the element so whatever the equations we have chosen your uh, polynomial functions or interpolation models they should be continuous so they should be continuous equations must be continuous within the element okay if this is your element your displacements whichever the value of displacement field variable you get they should be continuous okay they should be continuous so displacement must be compatible with the adjacent element if there are number of elements number of elements if you divide a body into number of elements okay so this element and this element should be compatible to each other okay should be compatible to each other this condition is satisfied by choosing the displacement model here displacement model depending on the problem you have to choose it okay and you know how to write the displacement model for the given element that we have studied it in the previous class so with the help of pascal's triangle and pascal's tetrahedron we can easily write this for a given element you can choose properly what is your displacement model okay so this is your first convergence requirement this is your first convergence requirement displacement model what are the equations interpolations model which you have written must be continuous okay adjacent elements must be compatible with each other Put yes if you have taken down. The second one is second the convergence requirement is the displacement model should include the rigid body displacements of the element. So what does this mean? Your this displacement function which you assume must contain such term that it should uh, give rigid body displacement. Okay, so that can be achieved by this constant term. Okay. This constant term when the nodes are given such displacement the element should not experience any strain okay the element should not experience any strain okay it means the displacement models there should be a term all points on the element to experience the same displacement okay same displacement 
at somewhere at all points it should experience the same displacement so that is achieved by providing this constant term in most of the equations which you assume the displacement models we are including this term okay we are including this constant term so the term a not provides rigid body displacement hence this to satisfy the requirement there should be a constant term in the shape function selected okay shape function selected so this is your second convergence requirement this term must be there so that there will be a rigid body displacement and it means what that this what that means is displacement models there should be a term at all points on the element all points on the element to experience the same displacement okay if you have this all points on the element will experience the same displacement okay so this is your second convergence requirement then the last one is so displacement model must be capable of representing constant strain rates within the element okay within the element so imagine the condition when the body on a structure is divided into smaller smaller and smaller elements we do that in afm right we divide a body into smaller and smaller elements as these elements approach infinite decimal size okay, as i've said to you if they approach if their size of the element is smaller and smaller the strains in each element should approach a constant value okay the strains should also approach a constant value hence the assumed displacement model should include terms to represent constant strain rate okay constant strain rate so that can be achieved by your these terms okay these your these generalized coordinates this can be achieved using your these generalized coordinates so this space model must be capable of representing constant strain rates within the element so these are the three convergence requirement first one it should be your displacement model should be if we your this interpolation model should be continuous second one it should uh, give a rigid body displacement and it should give constant strain rate within the element so these are your three convergence requirements okay if all the three conditions above stated are satisfied so your solution your element is set to converge your solution will converge it means your solution will be closer to your exact solution okay solutions which you get using this fea approach will be closer to your exact solution okay if you satisfy if these three conditions are satisfied only if only one and second condition is satisfied if this third condition that is constant strain rate doesn't satisfy so this is said to be a completeness condition so this case is known as completeness condition the solution will not converge but it is called as completeness condition okay completeness condition so these are your three convergence requirements these are your three convergence requirements these are just the examples which are written here
this is just the examples which are written here okay these are your interpolation models or displacement models On the last slide, we'll go through what are uh, compatibility conditions. Okay, we are not exactly going through what are compatibility conditions. So, FPM is a piecewise approximation. It means the given continuum is divided into smaller number of parts called elements. You know this. These elements will deform due to application of load. Okay, so when you divide a body into smaller number of subregions, when you apply a load in the in for the entire structure, when you apply those elements will deform okay so according to the compatibility conditions there are uh, different compatibility conditions which you come across when you there it is there in your different uh, subject okay there are six compatibility conditions so according to the compatibility condition displacement should be compatible between adjacent elements this we have seen it in the first uh, uh, convergence requirements so there should not be any discontinuity or overlapping while deformed when you apply a load between the elements there should not be any discontinuity or overlapping of the elements. The adjacent elements must deform without causing any openings or overlaps. Okay, especially when you are doing it in the software, right? There should not be any openings or overlaps or discontinuity between the elements. So this condition is satisfied by using the compatibility equation conditions. There are six compatibility equations, okay, which you come across. Okay, now based on this, you there are again two classifications of uh, elements. One is confirming elements, other is non-confirming elements or compatible elements or non-compatible elements. Okay. If the elements satisfy both convergence condition and compatibility condition, then the elements are called as confirming elements, confirming or compatible elements. If the element satisfies only convergence condition and not compatibility condition, then the elements are called as non-confirming elements. Okay. So again, there are two classifications of elements. One is confirming elements and non-confirming elements. If uh, both uh, convergence requirements and uh, compatibility conditions are satisfied, so then such type of elements are called as confirming elements or compatible elements. Okay, they will follow all this. Okay, and if they only satisfy convergence requirements, they are called as and not compatibility conditions. They are called as non-confirming elements. Non-confirming elements. 